It's for the question. <laughs> Because I will pick it up and go over there. Yeah. That's the only thing. Yeah. 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 Uh, 
For that, we would like to present him with a plaque. And the plaque says basically, Dr. Jonathan Twizler, 2015, SEC Lynn Lecturer, who is in the C-section of the American Cancer Society. Thank you very much. I tend to talk very loud, um, but if this is being webcast, I'll go ahead and use a mic. Um, it's a lot of fun to be here. Uh, I actually was here once before, I think in 88 or 80, I'm sorry, 98 or 99, different set of people mostly. Uh, so if you don't remember that visit very well, I certainly uh, don't remember too much about what I talked about. But hopefully no slides are the same, um, but the name hasn't changed. So my group does analytical chemistry and neuroscience and tries to blend the two, and I'm going to try to bring those two together uh, today. Um, I usually end with this slide, and I run out of time and kind of gloss over it. So this is the group. Um, as a faculty member, I get to sit around and take credit. Um, this is what it's supposed to be like now at Illinois, but it's actually looking more like that. We don't have any snow. Uh, and this was April Fool's Day a few years ago, and the group was making fun of my hair. Um, <laughs> some things haven't changed, but the reason I put these three slides up is the data I'll be showing is really from this time frame. So these are the uh, people who did the work, and I'll try to name uh, the right names uh, throughout the talk. So I thought I would start a little bit strangely. I got two people today asked me about the Brain Initiative, um, and there's also a little confusion. You know, so Obama started this presidential initiative uh, you know, uh, in neuroscience, and some people have said, why did he do that? And, and what isn't really recognized, even if um, it hasn't been very effective, or it has, is every president since Kennedy uh, basically picked an engineering or science initiative and said, that's it. And that's going to be the national push. And, and sometimes it's worked and some it hasn't. 
Uh, maybe uh, you don't remember, but Nixon declared war on cancer. If you talk about wars we won or lost, that one we certainly lost because he didn't, during his time, we didn't cure cancer and it's still a problem. It gets a little bit strange. Most people won't know as Bush is the nanotechnology president, but he did have a press release about that and then, of course, sequencing. Uh, and so um, this was Obama's brain initiative. Now, um, what's fun about this as an analytical chemist, and a lot of neuroscientists get upset, is his brain initiative to start with is not to understand how the brain works because the first part is you have to develop new tools to understand it. And, okay, I added this bold, it's to listen in between the conversations of billions of brain cells. Now, uh, this picture, I actually uh, showed a picture like this in Boston, and they said, wow, that's the picture of the Boston freeway system. Um, <laughs> And it may very well be, but it's supposed to indicate something about brains. Um, and so uh, the other thing I think is really amusing is I actually, you know, this impacts my group, so I actually listen to the announcement. And I know everybody always hears that presidents always overstate their case. Uh, Obama said this initiative could be transformative. Really strong statement. So I hope it does more uh, than that. So one of the things I thought I would do is just in three or four slides give some background. Many people have said, well, okay, I've seen on science and nature and the New York Times and every you know, USA Today once a week or once a month, there'll be pictures of these brain activation maps using MRI. And I just happened to pick this one. It's, it's, it's a neat set. Um, but you see the brain lighting up and you get activity in the brain. And obviously, we can Im image the brain. What else is needed? Um, interestingly, a single voxel, volume element you're doing in this is actually a few million cells. So you're not really measuring what's happening at the level required to understand how memory forms or a lot of other things. Um, I will admit, I'm not trying to make fun of this approach. If I have a problem with my brain, this is the approach I want to use. I don't want to use mass spectrometry. This is non-destructive. So it's a, you know, it's a great approach because it doesn't involve sticking things inside the head. So I'm not trying to make fun of MRI or in any way. It's a great approach, but we really need to move to the cell scale. And I put this slide up for a couple reasons. Um, this is a picture you often see. I like the picture. I could never draw anything like this myself. There's the credit. It kind of shows the brain is mostly empty space. Um, it's absolutely true. I've done some lectures, and I'm convinced some of the people in the crowd, this is the right model. Their brain is mostly empty space. Um, but that's not true. What it is is the brain is mostly not neurons. So. One of the mysteries of science is that if you go to Wikipedia or any old textbook, they tell you that 90% uh, of the cells of the brain are glia. Um, and then when you ask people in their favorite brain region, it's maybe more one-to-one. -one. But there's a lot of other cells in here. Matter of fact, there's more red blood cells in your head than there are neurons. And so if you were to take a microliter of, of brain, and then you, um, again, believe Wikipedia, that would have 100,000 neurons and about 400,000 astrocytes and about 400,000 red blood cells. If you were to do metabolomics or proteomics, you would get the brain information, but you wouldn't get neurons. Neurons are different and in between. And so really, you have to move to the cell scale. And the other reason you have to move to the cell scale is because some of the tasks, such as memory, um, uh, control of particular behaviors, are actually rooted at individual cells. Adjacent cells have very different uh, functions and actually neurochemical context. So, my group and many work across scales. Move that down a little so I, uh, this is actually showing a honeybee brain and it's a million cells. And I put this up because this is a brain slice from a rat brain and it's also a million cells. And so this is two scales. We work a lot at the neural net or neuronal net. This is actually the neurons from a sea slug that I'll show you later, a plesia californica, that control reproductive behavior. And you can keep them alive, form a network, and you can ask questions as this network tries to control the behavior, uh, what's happening? And you can actually look at this in terms of where molecules are, what the molecules are, and when they're there to try to understand how this acts. Now, this is far removed from here, I actually, but it is actually still a living network. And then here's a single hippocampal neuron. We work across these scales to try to address questions. And I thought for today, uh, I would mostly work on the lower end uh, and show some of our analytical results. So, this is showing a picture of uh, a neuron, a complicated neuron, uh, and I put this up for a couple reasons. Um, we tend to think of cell scale, single cells, as the limit. If this is what the cell looks like, and we talk about a cell, it's maybe down here. This single, for example, hippocampal neuron could actually have tens of thousands of connections to other cells, 
And actually, some of those connections are different metabolite, uh, you know, metabolomic compartments or uh, energetic compartments. And so we actually need to be a lot smaller than the single cell scale at times. And then you might want to know what the parts list is of this cell. And people still argue over that. Neil Kelleher tells, tells me there's about 100 to 200,000 proteoforms in a cell. So these are proteins with different post-translational modifications. Lipid maps, a consortium of groups looking at lipids, says there's probably about 50,000 chemical entities known as lipids. Uh, and the Human Metabolome Programs uh, pro Project says about 50,000 metabolites. Uh, I don't know how many are in a single cell. One of the problems is when we make measurements at the cell level, we're not getting anywhere near that number because of analytical limitations. But we can get some numbers. And then the other thing that I'll say is that while mapping is advanced, the chemical characterization is lagged behind. And so, um, you know, one of the questions that we would like to be able to address is, uh, you know, some people say they ask old questions. Aristotle, 2,000 years ago, asked the question, what is memory? And they basically came up with a wax tablet hypothesis where you have a blank uh, tablet of wax and, and, you know, memories are written onto the tablet. Um, some people argue, and there's lots of evidence for this, that the connections between cells drive memory. Some think it's something to do with chemical, chemicals. Uh, you can imagine uh, it's, you know, it's a combination of the two. Uh, what I find exciting is this is the decade where I think that question will be really answered. Could you actually uh, map uh, a memory uh, or understand a memory just based on uh, probing a system? There's nothing new about single cell measurements. Um, it depends on how you want to define it. Uh, uh, you know, hopefully nobody is uh, Dutch in the audience because I always butcher this name, but Leon Hoek um, uh, basically published a series of, of letters uh, uh, in the Royal Society uh, mapping out with the, the first, or not the first, but one of the first microscopes, a whole bunch of cell types. But I want to point out that Cajal came up with a way of staining entire cells, and he came first. He got to map and name all of the cell types in the brain, or not all, but many. And so they have all these names like stellate or pyramid or others because imaging came first. If a chemist had been first, which we weren't, they would have been named things like dopaminergic or serotonergic because that's the transmitter. And what's happened is chemistry has caught up to this. Suddenly, a, a homogeneous cell type has a lot of heterogeneity because chemistry is different. Now, I'm not saying either one is right. Whatever descriptor you want to choose could be right, but it could be based on a lot of different things. Chemical measuring of cells has been around for about, you know, I don't know how long you want to talk or what you want to call a cell. Obviously, an ostrich egg or a, a noocyte is large. But, um, you know, this from the 60s I thought was an amazing experiment. This is capillo-electrophoresis before it existed, um, a silk fiber in a, uh, a, a human environment, taking a single red blood cell and you could get protein content of a single cell. This experiment was so amazing, this group published it in science and never did it again. Um, and so sometimes uh, things are hard. Single cell from aplesia. And what's happened is since the 60s and 70s, the amount of information we get has become much uh, easier to deal with and much more robust. I think it's my last general uh, slide before I start showing, start showing data. Another point about mapping the brain in terms of chemistry is that in an adult brain or a child brain where things go wrong, it's very unlikely we're going to be able to go out and start rewiring the brain uh, externally. Um, yet we can change the chemical environment. And the other way to look at this is a lot of my group's funding comes from the National Institutes on Drug Abuse because trying to understand how cells of cell signaling works, that's actually a lot of drugs of abuse actually uh, hit their same receptors uh, and uh, take over that. And so, you know, the chemistry is our point of intervention for either pharmaceutical or illicit drug intervention. And then the other thing to point out, this is a human brain. This is what I've been talking about. Some people like the word nano. Synapses for glutamate or GABA are on the nanoscale. This is showing, you know, 30 to 50 nanometers across, showing a synapse here. This is actually a ridiculous picture because the synapse is full of proteins and other things. It's not empty space. I have people who sometimes think they can stick a, uh, if they had a small enough electro, they can stick it in there. But this is actually the densest part of the cell with less open space there than anywhere else. But a single molecule in that area for a typical glutamate synapse is about five nanomolar. Two molecules is 10 nanomolar if the molecules stayed there. So it's so small that single molecules matter. Uh, and so I find challenging is this is nanoscale and this is macroscale and how do you collapse those scales? One way to do it is to cheat. It's a great way to do it. Biology, the success of biology over the last dec uh, century has been by people who cheat. If you want to understand how electrical activity works in the brain, there was lots of people studying it. And one smart group said, I'm going to work on the squid giant axon because it's, well, it's this long. And actually, they 
got, you know, Huxley got the Nobel Prize because of that. So we cheat. It's not really a meter. I think that looks huge. But it's a millimeter. We work with aplesia. It has some of the largest cells, uh, neurons around, um, huge growth cones. Uh, we, most of the cells are. The median cell in aplesia is about 10, neuron is 10 microns. Just there's a few giant ones. The nice thing from an analytical point of view is you go from a millimeter to 100 microns to 10 microns, um, you're talking a million fold lower in volume um, and two orders times uh, cubed. And so as you get your technique working better, you can go to some of the more important cells. The other things are color coordinated. This is white. It has scattering centers. That's peptidergic. You can actually tell a lot about this. And so we work a lot in aplesia, and then we use these results to try to understand others. We're not the first. We're copying Eric Kandel. So the aplesia neurons actually have a Nobel Prize um, that's shared with Eric Kandel. Um, maybe it's the other way around. But he studied this animal, and he studied the simplest system that can do learning. This is part of the gill withdrawal reflex, and I put it up because when people talk about a simple system, I want to explain that it's pretty complicated. The L7 neuron here and a sensory neuron, uh, this is a memory-forming unit. Uh, and, you know, the genome of aplesia is about the size of the genome in the, uh, of a, a human. It's just being uh, uh, online. And the interesting thing is even though this is part of the gill withdrawal reflex, uh, the classical transmitter used by this cell is still not known. And my colleagues and we have measured it. There's no glutamate or GABA or serotonin or dopamine. Um, there might be some D amino acids that we're studying in this. But, you know, it's, it's a pretty complicated system. But this can undergo long-term memory, long-term potentiation. And you can actually start studying differences between this is when it learned and not learned. And this is the type of simple model system that maybe we can make uh, inroads in. Just to give you one example that's not mine, a former... Uh, uh, Postdoc of mine, Leonard Morose, who spent three years in the lab, is now at Florida. He's now been there for quite a while. Uh, he's a full professor, and he's been doing single-cell transcriptomics. And just to show you one more classical experiment with transcriptomics, uh, you can actually um, uh, do this, and you can actually uh, see that each individual neuron has different proteins that are up or down regulated as this undergoes memory. And so even something as simple as memory seems to be neuron-specific. And the specific genes that undergo, that go, undergo change as you do LTP uh, are quite staggeringly high. And you can actually reset it with serotonin. So these are the model systems. And now let me show you some of the measurements we can make. Now, the other thing I'll say is I don't do transcriptomics. We do mass spectrometry. Uh, for most of what I'm talking, my group does other techniques. But uh, this is more of a mass spec. Some of them are commercial. Uh, your department has Orbitraps. We have uh, different instruments. This is an FTICR. This actually was designed by Neil Kelleher. He moved to Northwestern. Uh, the moving van he took was not large enough, and so he left this behind in our lab, um, which is actually basically true. Um, this was actually, the two magnets were bought with local money, so he got to take one and left me one. This is a SIMS instrument that we use to image. Uh, I'm not going to go into how these work too much. Uh, my students hate this because, for example, a student made an entire PhD making this work, and I'll show you the data, and I won't show you, uh, any, you know, most of the work on the instrument. But uh, that's where a lot of the time goes. And so here's the other way to look at it. And I'm not going to go into these too much, but I do want to say one thing. Biologists sometimes ask, why do mass spectrometrists show pictures of instruments? You know, if you think about genomics, they don't show instruments. You could go into a, a you know, maybe our genetics, genomics facility has better or worse instruments. We, maybe we have, you know, Illumina versus a Pac Bio versus another. And, you know, it really matters to how much you pay, but it doesn't change the data you get. Every instrument gives you the same data, sort of. Um, the problem is, no matter what anybody here or I say, proteomics, peptidomics, metabolomics are not omic scale technologies. You don't see all the small molecules, for example. So there may be 50,000 small molecules, and if I see 1,000 to 5,000, I'm really happy. And which 1,000 to 5,000 I see depends on which platform I go into and look at. And so, you know, if I want to do imaging mass spectrometry with matrix-assisted laser desorption ionization mass spec, I tend to see a different set than if I use SIMS or LC or CEMS. And so each platform gives me a different set, and so it actually matters which one I use uh, and then which one we work on. So I'm not going to go into many more details about that, but it does matter. I am going to talk about mass spectrometry imaging. This is... Uh, a technique that's really uh, changing uh, one aspect of mass spectrometry. This is showing a, and I'll explain what it does. This is showing a rat spine, and you can kind of see it with an array of red dots. And basically what you do is you take your section 
of rat spine, brain, or anything else, and if you shine a laser right there, uh, you explode the molecules at that spot, and you can get a mass spectra. And everywhere there's a dot, you get a spectra. So it's called imaging because you can recreate an image. If you have a 10 micron resolution and you do 100 by 100, you get 10,000 data points at 10 micron resolution. So the spatial resolution is poor compared to optics, but at every point you get a mass spectra. And depending on whether you use light, laser desorption ionization, photons, or whether you use things like gold or even buckyballs uh, or argon clusters where you can go down in spatial resolution, but you fragment the molecules, uh, you get different types of information. Uh, with Maldi, you actually put an explosive on top. You shine a laser and it explodes. And to be honest, if you've done Maldi, you think I'm crazy describing it that way. But actually, TNT is a matrix that works. Um, and so it tends to be micron scale, but you can see proteins and peptides. SIMS is smaller molecules, uh, but it's much higher uh, spatial resolution. So I like to look in history. I actually, st we started doing this, and then you actually uh, discover Franz Hillenkamp, the discoverer of Maldi in the 1970s was using laser microprobe mass spectrometry, and he published a few papers uh, on this approach where he was at the single cell level. So I think these are some of the first single cell mass spec data. Uh, interestingly, I think Franz Hillenkamp deliberately tried to publish these in journals that no one would read. Uh, these are in microscopy journals that all went out of business, all are not available, and um, he was nice enough before he uh, passed away to send me some of the glass slides uh, of this, and he told me where they were published in every one of these out-of-print uh, bankrupt journals. No one owns the copyright because it's kind of not clear who owns the copyright. And so if you write a review and try to put them in, nobody will allow it because they say, you don't have the copyright. So I have no idea. This is why this work somehow is lost. But he's shining a five micron laser and he sometimes hit the soma versus others and you can get a spectra. And you know, there's no digitizers in those days. And so this is kind of old, old school, but this was mass spectrometry at five micron resolution and it worked. Um, this is a, our campus has a SIMS instrument. This is one not for my group, but actually one in a facility. And SIMS, we have a $3 million uh, SIMS instrument for one and only one reason. This is used to basically probe integrated circuits. So you can look at 16 nanometer resolution metallizations, tungsten metallization and others on integrated circuits. Um, I told them I wanted to do neurons and they said, if you come into the room with a biological sample, we will um, kick you out and ban you from the building. And I looked at the students who were working in there and they were actually using photoresist and they were the filthiest, I mean, just garbage all over them. And I said, I take it back, it's not a biological system. These neurons are grown on silica. It's a silica wafer, silicon wafer, and uh, we have a photoresist that has an unusual shape. We got these images and they said, great, you're welcome back anytime. So these look like neurons, it's actually photoresist. Um, no, these are actually a neural net and we can get down to about 400 nanometer resolution. Uh, you can see some things like you know, ions like potassium, you can see things related to uh, phosphatidylcholine. I put this up, this is a piece of vitamin, this is vitamin E or a fragment from vitamin E. Uh, I like this picture because I almost didn't include it in this picture. And when we published this, uh, I actually never had this happen before, but nobody can do subcellular imaging of vitamin E. You can't make an antibody to it. It's deep in the membrane. And so we actually had a company give us a third of a million dollars because they wanted to do subcellular vitamin E imaging. And I thought that was not a very good image, but evidently it was better than they got. So my student was right to include vitamin E, uh, and that's never happened to me since. So um, what we've changed since then is we built this, uh, so Eric Lanny spent five years, made an instrument, and what this was is we bought a, uh, actually uh, bought a, an old QSTAR instrument uh, uh, on a, a software bid, Dove, uh, a Dove bid, for $30,000, then I got yelled at by purchasing for about six months, but I still have the instrument, uh, and then we modified it, and now we can do uh, imaging, not with an instrument in an integrated circuit fabrication lab, but we can get higher resolution for SIMS, and we can do tandem MS, and so it works for single cells. Um, we can now see vitamin E a lot easier. We can distinguish in vitamin E uh, from other molecules. And if you look, uh, we can actually do tandem MS and, and fragmentation to prove it's vitamin E. And so uh, that doesn't look amazing if you're used to mass spectrometry, but since 99% of all SIMS instruments were designed for metallizations and integrated circuit fabrication, no commercial SIMS instrument until the last year or so actually had that capability because that's not what you needed uh, for that. And you can even do things like this. You can say within this cell, you can do simultaneous 
uh, EM, uh, in this particular case, the vitamin E is right there where we broke a, a piece off. And so you can um, see where the vitamin E is and you can localize it. So this is subcellular imaging with some chemical information. We're, all, we're actually getting a couple hundred compounds. I'm only picking one to show uh, because we know what it is. And again, this is a 50 micron cell, so it's a, it's a moderately large cell. I'm going to switch gears, talk about metabolomics, and then combine the two. So for metabolomics at the single cell level, uh, the way we do that is we use capillary electrophoresis mass spectrometry. Now capillary electrophoresis is the world's simplest separation approach in the sense that all you do is you put salt water inside a capillary, you hook it up between two buffer vials, so this is the capillary. If the capillary is 50 microns, the size of a hair, um, and you put 20,000 volts across it, then obviously positive molecules, if you inject at this end, go towards the negative electrode, negative go to the positive, uh, but you can actually have a surface pump, electrosmotic flow, so everything flows in one direction and separates based on mass to charge. It's simple because you could always make this capillary smaller, and this is our sample we, uh, system. We have a small vial, we put a single cell in it, we do electrophoresis across here with, in this case, 20,000 volts, uh, and here's the output into the mass spectrometer, here's the electrolyte, it's just in a nice humid box. Uh, it takes uh, a couple days to build that system and it works really well. Then I have to tell you how do you isolate the cell. Here's our slug, it could be up to a kilogram if you want to know the size. We, there is a green cell, it's a little hard to sh show. We do this a lot, and I have to say, it's very different than most people who do single cell measurements. Sometimes we've had collaborators, say at uh, Columbia University with um, uh, uh, John Coster, uh, who working on the gill withdrawal reflex, where he spends 12 hours finding a particular cell in the creature. There's only one, and he says, I finally found the cell. It has the right physiological connections. He injects green food coloring into it, drops the, group, the, the brain on ice, and ships it overnight to us. We then, I can't, my hand does this because I drink coffee. I have a few students who don't drink coffee, have unbelievable patience, and they will isolate that single cell. They will pull it out slowly, and there it is ready to do the injection. So sometimes it takes 12 hours to, or more to do a single cell measurement. Now I say that because I know a lot of people who say I took blood cells, cancer cells, did something, and I have 100,000 cells and I'm going to measure 10. We sometimes have five cells that took five days to prepare, and we have to have a 95% success rate, or my collaborators will kill us, and my student who's isolating will kill me. Um, especially because you know all about reproducible science. They show me great data with four cells, and I said, that's great, now make it 10. And then you realize what you've asked them to do. Other times are higher throughput, but this is one way to do an experiment. This is a single R2 neuron, and this is the type of data you can get. One one-thousandth of a single R2 cell, we get acetylcholine. It can't be detected using electrochemistry if you're used to the great work of Whiteman and others. It's not derivatizable with fluorescence. Um, and even in this particular case, our mass accuracy is great. Our signal noise ratio is great. We can do tandem mass. I know it's acetylcholine. And this is the type of data you can get from an aplesia. The cells have names. If you don't like them, metacerebral cell, LP11, R15. You can call them Bob and Mary and Joe and Phil or whatever you want. Every cell that has a name has a different function. This is the only serotonergic cell in the feeding network. And boy, it has serotonin. And the R15 cell is respiratory pumping. Um, NIH, as a priority, wants to know how many cell types are in the brain. Are they willing to do this in model systems and humans? No one even knows. Well, every one of these identified cell types, based on physiology, has different chemistry. R15 cell is the only cell that has something we've labeled unknown. It has an unknown mass, and unfortunately, it doesn't fragment. So if you want to think of why going to single cell measurements, you have a one kilogram animal, and this compound is only in one cell, and so it would be really hard to identify that in the whole animal. The other thing you can do is this is a principal component loading plot where you can say what makes those cells different. And every one of these dots are the loading of a different chemical compound. And these are the ones, we, the ones with numbers we've identified, the ones without, we're not sure what they are. Well, some are obvious. Serotonin cells or serotonergic cells have serotonin and HIAA uh, and other compounds. They seem to have lots of histamine, cholinergic cells. You know, that's obvious. These are in all cells. Uh, I don't know what these compounds are. Um, it's amazing to me how different the chemical profiles of different cells are. Uh, and so we're still learning this. Um, it's, they can be quite striking um, uh, within the brain. One more example that, you know, it's two slides and, and it's a fun story because it kind of is a, a warning story and then we'll, we'll move on uh, 
to more complex organisms. There's two almost identical cells, the buccal one and buccal two. They're involved in the feeding network. Uh, and if you isolate those cells from an animal and you pull them out and you look, this is the B2 cell, this is a B2 cell, freshly isolated and cultured for 24 hours, and then we measure it. Now, in the case of the B2 cells, you can, this principal component approach actually um, somewhat, you know, they are distinct. Uh, in the case of the B1, they're, they're very distinct. And so, uh, culturing for a day changes uh, their chemical profile, but what's a little bit stranger is this. Freshly isolated B1 and B2 cells are actually clustered differently in this chemical metabolome space. But after 24 hours, whatever made them different is completely lost. So you take an animal, you pull out two very similar cells that are adjacent to each other, and you, you analyze them, and they have different chemistry. You keep them alive and culture them for 24 hours, and whatever made them different is lost. And I point this out because I know lots of people that say, I work with primary cell cultures, and I keep them alive for a while, and I do all these things, and so they're as close to real as you can get. And at least in our hands, even 24 hours changes everything. And I can tell you now, Lean and Morose has gone back and done transcriptomics of these cells, uh, and this difference is, is really robust in the transcriptome. There's nothing magic about aplesia. Uh, we had a, I had a visiting uh, scientist, Susie Newpert, from Jena, Germany, who's even better at dissection, and I just put this one slide up because uh, this is where you start to get a little crazy. She worked with a fruit fly. Uh, these are five micron cells, and these are labeled with a GFP label for uh, a, a particular set of octopaminergic uh, neurons. They use octopamine as a transmitter, and she could isolate single five micron cells, actually and put them with a, a, a sharpened needle into the inlet of my 50 micron capillary and do capillary electrophoresis, and we can see things. And so if you can do the sample handling, we can detect. And I have to state that you know, this is really the limit. The mass spectrometry is not the limit. And so let me show you uh, now how we're doing a lot of these experiments. This is actually the, uh, the hardest experiments we do in terms of sampling. And it's using a, a Nobel Prize winning approach, patch clamp sampling. Uh, Nayer and Sockman got the Nobel Prize in 91. Uh, the idea is you can fire polish glass pipette, patch onto a cell, and you can form a great connection that forms a giga-ohm seal. Here is now in a rat, thalamic reticular neurons, doesn't really matter for this. Uh, but it's hard to see, but this cell was 9.6 and 8.5 microns. We sucked up about 30% of the cytoplasm. This is electrical activity. This is a trace of showing uh, spiking of the cell. And we videotape this, this cell stays alive during this. We take 30, or three picoliters of matrix out. We break it off in a vial and we do CE. So here is, we actually in the vial, we first have a dye. So we can see the morphology. We get electrophysiology. And then we get uh, this to do mass spectrometry, and it actually all works. And so we can get about 200 molecular entities, and we've identified about 50 of them in individual cells, um, and about 50% now are still unknown. I point out it's kind of fun because um, the spontaneously active TRN neurons, they actually look a little different, uh, turns out they have high levels of histamine, something that our, physiological, our physiologist colleague, uh, Lee Cox, was not expecting. We also were able to patch on to a few astrocytes. Uh, a long-term question, actually, there's an entire uh, set of proposals through the Common Fund answering a, or trying to answer a, a very simple question. Astrocytes are found throughout your brain. Are there different subtypes of astrocytes? Do they have, or are there one type and they change based on the context and where they are in the brain? People are trying to ad address that with transcriptomics. I don't know how to address it because every astrocyte we look at has very different chemistry. We've done about 50 astrocytes, and they, you know, neurons actually fall into categories. And that's been really nice to see. Uh, astrocytes, we, you know, we don't really, we don't have enough. And this is slow work. And so we're slowly building up this library. So I'm going to move away from small molecules to the area that my group has done the most uh, work, and that's neuropeptides. Uh, why are they important? Well, they, you know, they help you decide uh, when you're hungry, when you're full, when you're attracted to somebody, a lot of different, you know, they modulate a lot of behaviors. Um, I like this. I'm not sure which of the three, you know, which three. I've seen other people say four, but they're responsible for three or four of the deadly sins, uh, whatever that means. So why are neuropeptides hard? It's obviously a gene product. A DNA goes to RNA to a protein, and that's a neuropeptide prohormone. The problem is this protein then is targeted to the secretory pathway, undergoes a surprising amount of processing uh, in the vesicle, and before it's re re released, a single peptide is cleaved, all these different colored bars are supposed to be, indicate different peptides, and it has dozens, in some cases, of post-translational modifications, 
And the processing is complicated enough and cell-specific enough that it's really hard to make the prediction. Now, I will say that we've gotten a fair amount of money. We're as good a group as anyone at making those predictions. We have all sorts of binary logistic uh, and um, uh, neural net models to predict, but you still really have to make the measurement. Now, it turns out this is the world's simplest measurement to make with Moldy. Uh, we lucked out in this particular case. So again, Moldy is, or I think this was maybe from Star Wars instead, but you know, you can see Jabba the Hutt being hit by a laser, uh, but that's supposed to be uh, a cell getting hit by a laser and blowing up pieces. Um, this approach uh, is robust enough that you can take it a, a, a section of brain, replace it with isotonic dihydroxybenzoic acid, pull out a single cell or even cultural cells and replace. And if you shine a laser here, you can get all the peptides in that cell. Um, for the last four years, uh, Jim Everwine teaches a course on, at Cold Spring Harbor on single cell measurement and mostly transcriptomics and super resolution microscopy. We teach a couple days on single cell mass spectrometry. Um, TSA won't let us take the mass spectrometer on the airplane. And so what we do is we have the students do this and then we FedEx the plate back to Urbana and the next day they do a WebEx and they control the instrument. And the first years were kind of chaotic, but the last two years, 100% of the students have been able to do single cell measurements, both in terms of a, um, a rodent brain and an aplesia. So this works amazingly well. Now you can ask what happened to all the other molecules. It has to do with the matrix and the way we rinsed it. It works for peptides. You could pick others. And so I won't say mass spectrometry is, is general, but every peak here we can assign to what came from that peptide. And we've used this to discover literally a thousand peptides across the animal kingdom. But you could do things like this. This is a one and a half two femtoliter volume vesicle from a single cell, about a micron apart, and, and this vesicle has peptides in it, and this one doesn't. This is a cell body, this is a terminal, and I add a few nanoliters of matrix, and I see the lipids, in this case, and a few peptides. So I can say these peptides go from a cell body to a terminal. And so it's measuring, I don't even know what they are yet, what's there. How sensitive it is it? This is a commercial Bruker instrument. Uh, the ABI instrument is about the same. You can actually put spots on there, and at 60 femtomoles down to 3, 600 atomoles down to that, all the way down to the zeptomole level. Uh, and even when we're putting down 300 zeptomoles, we can see 100% of the time the spot. This happened to be angiotensin on a clean surface. Um, interestingly enough, if we used radioactive angiotensin, well, that's kind of weird. Why would we do that? Because afterward, we can image what was left. 90% of the peptide is still on the target. So. Our detection limit is about 100 zeptomoles, but at 100 zeptomoles, we're really only sampling 10 zeptomoles. So the instrument's capable of 10 zeptomole sensitivity, uh, but really you need 100 zeptomoles to work with. What's fun about that is that that's more than it's in a single vesicle. So this actually has enough sensitivity to do anything if sampling works. So we've done this hundreds of times. This is a cluster of neurons. Um, and this is basically, we find the cells based on gene expression. That cell had something of interest and it's gone. We don't normally use electron microscopy to image a missing cell, but it makes a pretty picture. This cell is gone. It's right here on this target. And I can tell you that cell had these peptides in it. And if that cell, if you stick an electrode in and fired, caused this animal to go into swimming behavior, then maybe one of these peptides is related to swimming. So when I say we've discovered hundreds of neuropeptides, we actually found thousands of peptides in all sorts of animals. But in the hundred cases, we've been actually able to say something about what it does. And we know what it does because we maybe know what that cell does. And so this has been the fun part of single cell discovery that mostly is not published in analytical. The problem with this, or the hard part about this, is this step. And this is just one more example. Um, this is a single cell here and we pulled it out, and we know that these cells contain aplesia insulin. This cell then has a peptide in it, and we actually sequenced the peptide. This is showing the raw data, but we then synthesized it, and we can show that glucose plus the peptide causes electrical activity in an insulin cell. Glucose by itself doesn't, and so um, this peptide seems to potentiate or modify uh, glucose rele or, uh, uh, insulin release. You can do the exact same thing, but turn it into dynamic measurements. This is a brain slice, but you can do this on a plesia. I'll show you. This is a 50 micron particle instead of a single cell. We can release peptides, pull it off with tweezers, put it on the mass spectrometer and measure it as if it was a cell. And we've been able to do this in all sorts of our animals, but I, this is, um, I think, the last example from a plesia. This is something I started when I was a postdoc and never worked. And this is actually stimulating egg laying behavior, and we could watch with these little particles in all sorts of different places, we stimulate, this is an after discharge 
telling us electrically the animal's going to egg-laying behavior, and you can watch ascending and descending uh, stimulation and release of peptides in every one of these different areas. Some we don't see, some we do. We actually see differential release at the uh, genital ganglia. Actually, it would be down in the basement. And so this is allowing us to take a pretty complicated endocrine system um, and take apart the behavior of, a, of, in this case, a cultured but living uh, part of the brain. I show this slide and people says, yeah, but does it work in mammals? I've never understood that question because the mass spectrometer doesn't care whether it was, I mean, obviously it doesn't care what the source of the cells are. But this is an 8 micron cell from a rat pituitary. Uh, now we're actually getting, again, hard to isolate, but there's lots of cells. So you can grab a single cell. Here it is. We do mass spectrometry on it. This is uh, about six identical cells, and some of them have peptides and some don't. And if you actually wanted to show this in a biochemical way, if you're not used to this, I apologize. This is the prohormone, and every one of the boxes are peptides that we detect inside a single cell. So then, for example, it lines up with that peak. And the length of the box is the, the mass. And these are the names of them, and so alpha, MSH, and other. These are important neuropeptides and neurohormones. And we can do this at individual cell level. Um, so now let me show you how to make this high throughput. I put this slide up for two reasons. One is... Everybody thinks of cells as small. The cells in my spine are long. I have cells that go from my DRG down to my toes and up to my brain. They can be three to four feet long or even longer. Uh, I also put the slide up uh, because I was told when I started at Illinois uh, by people at Northwestern and other universities, there's an inverse correlation between the quality of a football team and a chemistry department. And I assure you now, Illinois chemistry is doing great. Um, and that's all I can say about that, so we better go on. But, you know, it's the only time I get to... So, um, you know, you can take a rat, you can take a, a, a hundred micron section of rat spine, put it on a multi-target, and then pull it off and do whatever you want, and a little bit of liquid, scum, whatever you want to call it that's left behind has all of these peaks in it. It's really complicated, and we can't make heads or tail of it. So again, we go to single cell level. Uh, one last, you know, silly slide uh, before I show you that. How big can a neuron get? Uh, I guess a dorsal root ganglia from a blue whale would have to be the record at 100 feet long. Uh, it, now, I say I guess because you can look in Gray's Anatomy, you can look anywhere else, there's no reports. I actually kind of am interested because there is a general relationship between cell soma size and, and process length. And so a mouse is about 20 or 30 microns, or a rat is about 60. Some, the largest DRGs in a human are about 100 microns as they are in a porpoise and things. So I don't know how big a soma you need for 100 foot long. But this is probably beating the aplesia in terms of the largest cell that nobody is, obviously you're not going to sample a blue whale for this. So I show you the blue whale. This is not whale work. We're going back to a rat. Um, and we've done mass spectrometry on this entire network. And uh, I'm just going to show you a few people, a uh, few things. The other thing I like putting up here is to remind people, uh, I'm over 50 years old. We'll leave it at that. My DRG neurons are over 50 years. I could have a dorsal root ganglia that has a nociceptive field somewhere in my spine, and maybe it's never, I've never gotten a pinprick there. Maybe that cell has waited 50 years to fire and hasn't fired. Now, I doubt that. But the cells are not part of the cell cycle. They live as long as you do, and if they're damaged, that's it um, in some cases. And so they're very unusual cells, and they are, very, you know, they are different in many ways. But you can actually uh, take individual neurites, axons, in this case, actually, they're... Um, they're unipolar cells, uh, and you can do mass spectrometry on it. And every isolated uh, uh, neurite actually has a different peptide profile. We've actually pulled off the Schwann cells. This is a different part of the brain. I put this up because a lot of people say if you take a sample that's a, a microliter and you go to a nanoliter, you've lost, well, a thousand-fold. But if the nanoliter has all of the sample, you haven't lost anything. And so it just gets a simpler spectra. And that's actually how a lot of this works. You can do single-cell measurements. Uh, this is a collaborator who actually labeled particular DRG neurons that are fluorescently green, uh, or there's yellow fluorescent protein, but they look green to me. 25 microns, so you can isolate them and you can actually see what they look like. These are the spectra. And you can start asking questions of how they respond to a painful stimuli. I'm showing you this example because you can go one step further. This is now when we lose contextual information, but we can take a DRG and scatter it over a microscope slide. There's some cell soma, there's fibers, these are just fibers. And we can actually do mass spec imaging on this. And this is 1,200 individual cell spectra. We looked for just the cells. And these 250 uh, were, where we, were from a DRG where we injected uh, formalin into the foot, so nociception. These were the 
Uh, uh, other side, this is a water injection, and this is the other side, we collected a few more. And it turns out one, two, three, four responded. Now this is a mass spectra, it's like a, uh, between only 340 and 348, and some cells have a huge peak and some don't. So presumably these four neurons with these dark bars responded. And I like this example because I think one of the best metabolomics experts out there is Gary Suzdak. He did a very similar experiment and he saw no changes, but he couldn't do it at the single cell level. He used all of them and, the, and you're swamping out the change. And the exact same data set is shown here, but this is actually the distribution of a tachykinin related peptide. And there is, you know, in this particular case, just a few animals because you can see it. And you know, yeah, there might be differences down here, but these are the cells that responded. Now, this is principal component space in three. They look really similar, but these are the cells that actually seem to be having the big response. Now, one of the fun things about this from an analytical point of view is it only takes a few minutes to acquire this data. And the second thing is 90% of the sample is left on the target. So I can go back to this cell and say, what changed? And we recently have started doing work where we actually go back to the same XY coordinate, suck, you know, actually extract the contents of the cell, whether it's in a spine or a single cell, this is actually capillary electrophoresis mass spectrometry, which I've already shown you, on the same 20 micron DRG after we did MALDI. So one of the advantages of MALDI is it's fast, it's not necessarily quantitative, but I can do thousands of cells and then say these, this is the cell of interest. And I guess I could have, didn't, I mean this could have been Raman, this could have been transcriptomics, uh, I haven't verified that the RNA survives MALDI, uh, but most of the stuff stays behind. And so this is kind of fun. Now, the way I did that was not very good. I imaged this. And so one way to look at it is if you actually think of the cells as the black dots, I actually rastered this across. Instead, I could actually image the cells with optical microscopy and only shine the laser on the cells. And then what I could do, instead of acquiring a million data points and finding the cells by bioinformatics, I can only acquire cells at the, uh, that I want. And so this idea is shown here. You basically take your microscope slide, you put a, strangely enough, uh, we use a, a Sharpie pen that has gold particles in it, and you blast the laser at it, and you make marks. We take it out, we scatter the cells or do whatever we want with them. We know their exact coordinates. We actually use optical microscopy with a nuclear dye, or we use labeled cells using uh, a fluorescence encoding. Uh, we add matrix, and then we acquire the data and you can tell them apart. So how well does it, and you can actually see just targeted cells, how well it works? This one we published, um, this is uh, about 10,000 pituitary cells get spread out on a target. Now what we did is we actually said any time we saw two dots within about 40 microns of each other, don't count it. Why? Because then our mass spec might blend two cells. So we ended up with 3,000 well isolated cells and we acquired spectra and it only took about an hour and a half. What was scary about this is my student did this 10 times and we had 50,000 cells and they said, now what do I do? I said, I don't know. This acquires too much data. But with 3,000 cells, you can actually start going through and seeing um, information about this. And I'm gonna give you one example what, you know, that's unpublished that really shows you how well this works. We can go to really small cells uh, of an islet. This is a, a, an endocrine structure that has insulin. Um, there's a couple hundred cells uh, in an islet and we've gone to the dorsal and the ventral area and pulled out living islets. We've verified that they can still release uh, glucose, and, uh, insulin to glucose stimulation, but we did mass spectrometry on it, and when we use this approach for an islet, um, with, uh, it separates the cells into the alpha, beta, gamma, and delta cells just based on the peptides. Uh, we, this was, not, this was you know, unsupervised, and the peptides uh, are the main differences between the cell types. Now, it turns out about 50% of the cells had no peptides. I don't know if those are you know, non-peptidergic cells, uh, but we actually get great statistics. So we can see slight differences in the amount of alpha cells and dorsal or beta cells in the different regions. Um, and they actually match literature reports. But this is the first time anybody's done single cell uh, mass spectrometry on the islet, and we suddenly have thousands of cells. And you can actually find new things. So a cell type that's not well known or not well characterized in terms of function is the pancreatic uh, uh, hormone cells, and that makes a peptide that weighs uh, 43.99. We find a cleavage at a dibasic site and a cleavage here at a monobasic site different in the dorsal and ventral part of a, a rat pancreas. And statistics, they're very different. There's a few weird cells that have different peptides, and none of these peptides have actually been biologically tested. They're, they were known to be uh, at low levels in one case, in other cases not detected. 
uh, and they said, oh, something at a low level probably doesn't do anything, but they're not at low levels, they're at high levels in a few cells. And so this is the type of information that pops out with this high throughput single cell measurements. Um, truly running out of time, so I have one last example, and it's about time. And everything, including the end of my lecture, is related to time. Uh, and uh, everything about a biological system is time. So this is some work with uh, Martha Gillette, and I decided to add it after a conversation last night. The SCN is about 5,000, 10,000 neurons. Um, and I will say, um, this is, I'm showing a human brain. This is work we've done in a rat. But the suprachiasmic nucleus in all mammals uh, controls all uh, the body's, it, 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 it synchronizes all the body's clocks. What's interesting is that it's been known for over 20 years, if you lesion an SCN, the animal loses its biological clocks. If you take another rat, for example, take out its SCN, encode it in a polymer that only allows peptides and small molecules out, and put it into the ventricle, and so it's floating in the cerebral spinal fluid, you can actually restore biological synchrony. Um, it so has to be peptides or small molecules that are doing this. None of the known neuropeptides in the SCN work. So we first did a peptidomics experiment. We actually found 100 endogenous peptides within SCN. This is with Martha Gillette and Neil Kelleher. This is just showing you some of them. Many of them were novel peptides. Um, I don't know what to do with these lists. I'm just showing a small one. Uh, this is just showing you, this is one that wasn't expected, cerebellin-1. Using an FTMS, you can prove what it is. So now, okay, what do these molecules do? This is where you get a little bit clever on sampling. This is a living SCN. You actually take the SCN slice, out, uh, you could actually have an optic nerve. You can stimulate the optic nerve and collect release with these particles, uh, and then you can see the peptides. And so this is what you get. Before you stimulate the retinal hypothalamic tract, you get nothing, really. You stimulate it, you get lots of peptides. So these five to 10,000 cells, neurons, are actually releasing lots and lots of peptides, and some of them uh, are actually released at a particular time of day. Uh, and the peptides releasing at time of day depends on stimulation or time of day, circadian time, you know, morning or afternoon. So based on this data, we're able to actually figure out what some do. And I'm just going to show you one of our first examples of figuring out the function of a mammalian peptide. There's a peptide that starts with serine, alanine, alanine, serine. That's SACE. So little SACE. It's actually longer than that. Uh, turns out is released at a particular time of day. So we actually tried some experiments with Martha Gillette. This is single unit recordings. Uh, and if you, so this is electrical activity of the slice as if it was maintaining. And if you add S, uh, this peptide, you shift it uh, by about an hour and a half. It turns out you can add little SACE at 100 picomolar or 1 micromolar, you get the same shift. And it's basically the same response as stimulating the optical uh, nerve, the retinal hypothalamic tract at that time of day. So we went from mass spectrometry discovery to a function of a peptide. And what's really kind of fun is uh, Pintar, in an unrelated, wasn't working with us, made a little SACE knockout animal, and that animal doesn't reset its biological clock when exposed to light at that particular time of day. So our discovery methods do work and do allow us to find peptides. And uh, it also allows us to find things like this. The most well-known uh, SCN peptide is vasointestinal polypeptide. We can't really detect it, but we see a shorter form. And I show uh, biologists that have spent a decade studying the function of VIP in the SCN, and they get kind of mad because they say, obviously, it's there. They used immunohistochemistry. Um, but we see a shorter form cleaved, at, again, uh, not a, a, a dibasic, I mean, a dibasic, but not a KR, but an RK. And this peptide not only is released at a particular time of day, um, it turns out it hits the same receptor that full length does. And so VIP full length and VIP short have the same function of either advancing or de uh, delaying the biological clock at particular times of day. Why does this matter? Well, if you cleave off a single amino acid from this, it loses all function, and this one does not. So they have very different constants after release. But again, the problem is not that VIP full length is active. This one is not released. Right? So if it's not released, it's not the biologically active peptide. And so here's a case where uh, we, we've used mass spectrometry to look at a well-known peptide, and uh, it really is the peptide that people have been looking at appears to be the wrong one. This is my last slide, and it's a summary slide, uh, and it really is wrapping up a few things. One is in terms of the Obama's Brain Initiative, uh, physical mapping in terms of microscopy, cryo-electron EM, the super-resolution techniques, 
is really revolutionizing our understanding of how the brain functions in terms of connection, connection. but the single cell characterization has really not reached omic scale in the sense that many of the molecules of interest we still yet can't yet characterize. The other thing I want to bring up is I know a lot of students tell me, I wish I was at the point where I could discover new molecules, now we're figuring out what they do. Every model organism, including mammals, that we look at with our approaches, we find a surprising range of new molecules that were unexpected. And then the last thing uh, I really have to drive home is dynamic range. Synapses are nanoscale. I actually showed you things where cells are apart by uh, centimeters or meters. It's absolutely no question that glutamate signaling is milliseconds, but just as important as understanding why DRG neurons stop functioning over decades. Right? And so, uh, and then molecules are nitric oxide to proteoglycans. And so it's not that we always have to be the fastest or the smallest molecule. We want to be able to go over many orders of dynamic range. Uh, depending on the question, and actually there's very few techniques that allow us to work on scales of micron and nano and also centimeters and larger. And that's actually one of the particular challenges of the brain, is coming up with approaches that allow us to telescope over so long uh, dynamic range, not only in time and space, but also chemistry. And with that, I thank you very much for spending an hour uh, over the dinner time and listening. Thank you. enjoyed the talk. I was a little bit confused in various places on your, on your lecture. You said we can measure these masses and we don't know what they are. And in other cases, you seem to be able to sequence everything and know lots about them. What determines when you know what a molecule is and, or a, a mass peak is and when not? It depends on effort. Okay. So if you're working at the single cell level, it's pretty hard to get high quality sequencing data. And so, uh, whether it's an Orbitrap or an, uh, you know, an FTMS, it doesn't have the sensitivity. So in Maldi, we can see a peak. Uh, but there's not enough to sequence. And the problem is, one way you sequence, even with a Maldi, is you keep on going back with the same laser pulses, and eventually, you, you know, even though I said, so it's gone. So what we did in the SCN, for example, is I showed you release from a single SCN at particular times, with, and I get a lot of accurate masses to four or five significant figures. Then what I did is I abused my collaboration with Martha Gillette, and I said, can I have uh, 100 SCN punches at this time of day and this time of day? And now I have a lot more samples. And we did both differences with time of day, but we have enough to do a typical LC peptidomic measurement. And that one, we got the absolute identities with E values of you know, 10 to the minus 40, you know, 40, and those we know. Now, I'm, I'm making an assumption the mass at 1142.135 is the same mass at the exact same mass in that punch, and therefore I can assign what I saw in the punch, the, the big experiment, to the small. I could have isobaric molecules where there happened to be two molecules of the same mass, and I sequenced in one case, and in the cell I got the wrong one. But I'm pretty, you know, so what I'm doing is I'm cheating. At the single cell level, I see a mass, and then I did things at a bigger scale and figured out what they were. And so that's how I did that. So if I'm, you know, and then um, in a few cases, a cell has enough. Glutamate in a serotonergic cell, you know, or something, there's enough material there, you can actually get a little bit of information. And it doesn't take much to prove that it's glutamate. So it, I, you're right. I kind of play fast and loose because the SCN work, it was five years of work to actually get those identifications. So I can list them and say, wow, that was easy. The problem with that is then people say, I want you to do the same in my brain region. It's like, well, you know, that took actually between the biology and the chemistry and everything else. In some ways, if you count five years of work, that was half a million dollars of, of personnel time and things. But it's a good question. Any more questions? I see you talk about sea slugs at dinner. Everybody. Right. <laughs> Maybe I'm not going to go home and eat. <laughs> Okay, I'll reserve my questions for, for dinner. So, uh oh, let's go.